Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Jörg Damarinic, ich bin die Leiterin des Interkulturellen Zentrums und freue mich, Sie heute in der neuen Uni begrüßen zu dürfen. Ich freue mich auch, den Gastredner des heutigen Abends zu begrüßen, Sreczko Horvath, herzlich willkommen in Heidelberg. Heidelberg liest neue Weltliteratur, ist ein einjähriges Literaturprojekt mit drei unterschiedlichen Formaten. Im ersten titelgebenden Format lesen etablierte Autorinnen und Autoren und begegnen etablierten Kritikerinnen und Kritiker. Mit Lesen in der Lutherstraße hat das Interkulturelle Zentrum ein Stadtteilprojekt ins Leben gerufen, bei dem an vier Freitagnachmittagen diesen Sommer vier Spielorte in der Lutherstraße mit Programmen von und für Heidelbergerinnen gespielt werden. Auf dem Neuenheimer Markt gibt es Live-Musik ab 16 Uhr und nach der 20-Uhr-Lesung im Bürgerhaus eine gemeinsame Lesung für alle. Und zuletzt eben das dritte Format unter dem Namen Europe Upside Down, doch dazu gleich. Denn das alles wäre nicht möglich ohne zahlreiche Kooperationspartnerinnen und Partner, Fördererinnen und Förderer, denen ich herzlich danken möchte. Dem Kulturamt der Stadt Heidelberg, dem Ministerium für Wissenschaft, Forschung und Kunst, und an dieser Stelle passt es gut, auch der Universität Heidelberg für ihre freundliche Unterstützung zu danken, denn schließlich sind wir heute Abend hier in ihren Räumen. Jetzt zu Europe Upside Down. Europa befinde sich im Zerfall, hört man. Gibt es überhaupt noch ein Europa, wie es gedacht war, als Kontinent der Solidarität? Die große Diskussion begann mit dem Thema, und das ist inzwischen, mit einem Thema, und das ist inzwischen verhältnismäßig ruhig geworden ist. Die Schuldenkrise in Griechenland. Da war schon die Frage, was haben wir hier denn mit dem da unten zu tun im öffentlichen Diskurs? Beruhigt hat sich das alles erst, als dann Menschen nach Europa kamen, die als Flüchtlingsströme bezeichnet wurden und mit dieser Bezeichnung alle Ängste von überschwemmt werden bis ausgeliefert sein mit in die Öffentlichkeit gespielt wurden. Wenn einige schon meinten, mit Griechenland, einem Land in Europa, nichts zu tun haben zu müssen, wie sollte man dann für Solidarität mit Menschen außerhalb Europas werden? Europe Upside Down soll uns nicht deutsche Perspektiven näher bringen, denn natürlich blicken die Ränder Europas anders auf diese Konflikte und Diskurse, als wir es hierzulande zu tun. Eine Stimme aus dem Süden Europas, die seit Jahren zu hören ist, ist die von Serge Kohorvat. Geboren in Ostsee, Kroatien, hat er die ersten acht Jahre seines Lebens in Deutschland verbracht. Ich glaube, er versteht mich auch ganz gut jetzt. Ja. Ähm, er ist studierte Philosoph und man wirft der Philosophie ja heute gerne vor, dass sie sich zu weit herausgezogen habe, dass sie das Feld der Welterklärung anderen überlassen habe. Doch Elfenbeintürme halten Sreczko Horvath nicht lange gefangen. Neben Büchern, die er gemeinsam mit Slavoj Žižek oder Igor Stix schreibt oder herausgibt, organisierte er das subversive Festival in Zagreb. Man könnte es auch eine vorübergehende Pilgerstätte europäischer Linker nennen. Er hat sich vom subversive Festival verabschiedet und führt seine Debatten nun am Nationaltheater Zagreb. Seinen Themen ist er treu geblieben. Wie nahe am Fluss der Zeit ist, zeigt die Auswahl seiner Gäste beim Subversivfestival. Alexis Tsipras, bevor er Alexis Tsipras war, den alle kannten, war dort. Und das Böhmermann-Video um Janis Varoufakis, waren Fake, Stinkefinger oder nicht, stammten auch vom Subversivfestival. Auch im Nationaltheater bleibte sein Gästen toll und hatte auch unter anderem Slava Zizek zu Gast. Er hat über Occupy Wall Street geschrieben, das World Social Forum in Seneca. Er ist einer, der treibenden Kräfte von Democracy in Europe Movement 2025, DiEM 2025, gemeinsam mit Janis Varoufakis. Heute erst erschien im Guardian seine Analyse zu Europa und ich freue mich, dass er heute Abend hier nach Heidelberg gekommen ist, um sie uns persönlich zu präsentieren und mit uns ins Gespräch zu kommen. What does Europe want? fragt Svetko Horvat und ich überlasse ihm das Mikrofon. sagen, obwohl mein Deutsch nicht sehr gut ist. Es ist mir eine sehr große Ehre, in Heidelberg zu sein, zum ersten Mal, weil sehr viele Denker, die wichtig auch für meine Arbeit und mein theoretisches Denken waren, kamen aus Heidelberg, von, von Hegel zu Fichte und so on. So it's really a great honor to be in Heidelberg. Uh, but at the very beginning, I must warn you that this will not be a philosophical, uh, philosophical lecture. Uh, unfortunately, although I would rather like to deal with philosophy, uh, but I think today uh, we are in a such situation that uh, we need to also philosophers 
uh, needs to not only interpret the world, but to paraphrase the famous poem of thesis, uh, but they have to attempt to first to understand it in order to change it as well. Uh, so the, 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 the title of, of my today's lecture is What does, Europe, what, what does Europe want? Which is, as you probably know, a paraphrase of a famous, like, of, of a famous question which uh, the father of psychoanalysis, uh, Sigmund Freud, posed in his late life. Uh, he asked the question, what will this like? And he never got an answer to this question. <laughs> So I don't want to go into feminist discussions now and so on, uh, but what is interesting is that uh, uh, I think I use this as a kind of reference paraphrase uh, just to show that actually my answer to the question was will Europe, Europa is that Europe actually doesn't know what it, what it wants. And it's, it's very difficult to answer the question what does Europe today actually want. Uh, so what I'm trying to do today, tonight, is actually to invite you into a, into a journey through today's Europe, uh, into a journey through the long but short history of the 20th century, uh, from the beginning of the First World War to something which I think it could be soon a beginning of a Third World War. Uh, and if you are not able to answer the question, what does Europe want today, uh, I think uh, there won't be any Europe anymore. Which is also one of the reasons why together with Yanis Varoufakis and with thousands of people, uh, uh, activists, intellectuals, all around Europe we start a democracy in Europe movement with a very simple but radical thesis that either Europe will democratize, will be democratized or it will disintegrate. And actually what Yanis and me share but also some other people is that we really fear that Europe is falling into a kind of postmodern abyss, which is very similar to the 1930s of the last century, and that if we are not able today to create a broad front, of, which would consist not only of, of the radical left, but also of the social democrats, liberals, honest conservatives, if you want, and so on, that we won't be able to, to stop uh, the falling into this kind of abyss which I think George Lukács named it very well. He was writing about Hotel Atmund, uh, which was a kind of hotel where the intellectuals lived, uh, and they were having, you know, nice dreams, they had uh, jazz music and so on, but there on this side there was the Atmund. And I think today we are finding ourselves in this situation precisely uh, where we have, where we are facing the Atmund. Uh, we could have seen, I think, there are at least three developments of the 2016 where we could have seen that uh, we are just be beyond, below the, the, or even below the Atlantic. And these three de developments were first, it was Greece, as was Jagoda mentioned already. Uh, second, it is the refugee crisis. And third, is, as I, is, I would say, I would add, and you will see why all this is connected, it's terrorism. Uh, from Paris to Brussels, but not only terrorism, but also the, uh, our European reaction to terrorism acts. Uh, but before I start with these three developments, I would just like to offer a, a short uh, historical parallel, because it's very interesting that uh, just recently two books came out, one in UK and one in Germany, uh, which focus on the same topic. Uh, I don't know if one writer did uh, just take the, the, the things from the other writer or it was the other way around. I don't know who is the original thinker here. Uh, so one is uh, Charles Emerson, uh, his book on 1913, In Search of the World Before the Great War. And the other author, maybe you know, he is currently at uh, Spiegel uh, bestseller list, that's Florian Illis, uh, who wrote a book, Neun uh, Kunderdreizen, there's one other secundance. And both of these books, and it's very interesting that they actually appear at the same time, uh, deal with the same thing. Both of the books start with the thesis that 1913 was the historical year uh, when the future of Europe, which is now of course known as history, uh, was decided. And when you look what they do, it's very interesting because it can answer us also some questions about our present moment and about our possible future. Uh, so both authors, it's not only one, but both, uh, 
mention a very curious historical fact, uh, which is that in 1913, in Vienna, very, six very interesting people lived in a very short period of several months, uh, several hundred meters away. One of them was a worker from the country where we come from, or at least me, because we were born in, in, in Germany, but anyhow, uh, that's Croatia. So this was a Croatian worker who was 21 years old, and he was working in Wien Neustadt, your Daimler, which would then become Daimler Benz, of course. Uh, then you had two Russians, who would soon become revolutionaries. You had a father of psychoanalysis. Uh, you had a guy who was only 24 years old, I think, and who was a very unsuccessful painter. And then you had, of course, uh, someone who was a trophy hunter and who would soon become the Archduke of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. So, as you can guess, the first one is Josip Broz Titov. The, the two Russians are Trotsky and Stalin. At the same time, what is also interesting, Bukharin lived in Vienna as well. Dan's successful painter, right? We are in Germany, we don't have to talk so much about him, you know who he is. It's Hitler. And, of course, there is Freud at the same time. So what these two authors show in these books is that, for instance, Stalin and Hitler were, at the beginning of 1913, having long walks at Schönbrunn. Uh, we don't have any data if they ever met, but imagine Stalin and Hitler meeting in, in Schönbrunn in Vienna. Uh, probably history would have looked differently. Uh, then in Vienna you have the famous uh, Café Central, uh, where most of them hanged and they were drinking and discussing, not together, but maybe yes. For instance, Trotsky was a regular guest in Café Central, he was a shark player, and they say he was the best one, he always uh, was winning. And if you read Florian Neely's book, what he does, and I think it's very interesting, uh, he, really, he really brings us into, into the 1913 atmosphere, where he shows, okay, it's not only Vienna where you have this situation, uh, but the 1913 was a crucial year, uh, in the sense that you have very curious developments. For instance, uh, Charlie Chaplin in 1913 signed his first film contract. Uh, in 1913 in New York, uh, the Federal Reserves were founded. In 1913, Machu Picchu was discovered or rediscovered. In 1913, ecstasy was discovered as well, which is also very interesting. In 1913, Theodor Adorno had only 10 years old. In 1913, Marcel Proust began to write his search in lost, in the search of the, of, of, of the lost time. At the same time, it is a year, and that's also interesting, it could actually give us also some very interesting philosophical uh, conclusions. It is a year where you have something which is really a radical change when it comes to art. On the one hand, in painting, you have uh, 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 Malevich, Kandinsky, of course, then you have Klimt, Egon Schiele, and so on. Uh, but then you have Marcel Duchamp as well, in the same year. When it comes to music, it is the, it is the year of Schoenberg. So what you can see is that just one year be before the outbreak of the First World War, something very interesting is also happening in the field of art, uh, music, painting, where actually it goes in a different direction. And then, of course, you have futurism. Uh, this, uh, not only in Italy, but also in Russia, the belief that the future is coming, unlike Heidegger, who believed that technology will completely destroy us, the futurists believe that actually technology will give us an opportunity to live in a better future. And then what happens? In 1914, of course, uh, one of these six guys, it was Franz Ferdinand, goes to Sarajevo and he is assassinated. Uh, then, already three years later, the October Revolution begins, where precisely these two Russians from Vienna became the main protagonists, uh, and Bukharin and well, together with, with Trotsky and Stalin. Then, at that, at that time, Tito also became active in the, in the communist movement. He would soon become the leader of Yugoslavia and also one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement. Uh, then, in 1933, in January, the unsuccessful painter becomes the Reich Chancellor. And then, in 1938, if you ask yourself what happened to Freud, after the, 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 the Anschluss, 
uh, the Gestapo came after Freud, and Freud, here we come to our today's times, Freud became a refugee in London. So what you can see is that only one year later, history started to happen. But if there is, why I'm mentioning this? Because if there is one good lesson which we can take from popular culture about uh, the relationship between past, present and future, uh, then it is the lesson of a movie which is called Back to the Future, which you probably watched. And the basic scenario in Back to the Future is that uh, uh, a guy goes to the future, uh, travels with a time machine into the future, changes something in the future, but by changing something in the future, he is actually changing the past. And the main lesson of Back to the Future is, I would say, and that's a lesson which I think we need today, precisely, and this is the reason why I'm mentioning this historical parallel, is that, in a way, although it might sound counter-intuitive, uh, uh, or even paradoxical, uh, that uh, precisely by detecting the signs of the future in our present moment, uh, we are also, in a way, able to change the past which doesn't mean that we can erase uh, 28 million Soviets who died, for instance, in the Second World War, which doesn't mean that we can erase Holocaust, but it means that by, by giving a different meaning to this past, 1913, I think, or by understanding it, we are also able to, to, to understand what kind of future might be around the corner in something which I would call is the upgrade. So, let's move through the 20th century, when the, when the First World War was declared, you have one of the most remarkable and also one of the most famous diary notes in history. It is Franz Kafka, who on the 2nd of August, 1914, writes in his diary, Deutschland hat Russland den Krieg erklärt, nachmittags schwimmt vor. Which means actually that Germany declared the war to Russia, but I had to go swimming in the afternoon. And it doesn't mean that Kafka, of course, didn't care about uh, uh, the world war, but it will bring us into something which is a problem which exists today as well. Uh, it is the problem of parallel realities, I would say. Realities which exist, which were best described by Charles Dickens, for Charles Dickens, for instance, when he said it is a book about Paris and London, two cities, uh, just before the French Revolution and after the French Revolution. It's called Tale of Two Cities, where he says, we live in the best of times, we live in the worst of times. We were living in the times of despair, we were living in the times of, of hope. And he actually describes that at the same time, you can have both. And this is also what, what comes out of Kafka's, uh, Kafka's uh, diary sentence. And I think we have to perceive that today. Someone else, another writer as well, uh, actually lived through the 20th century and wrote one of the best books, uh, which I think is still much better than both of the books which I, which I named at the very beginning. If you really want to understand the first half of the 20th century, you have to read The Guns from Gestern uh, from uh, Stefan Zweig. Because it is a man who lived in Vienna at the same time as those people as well, and who was a Jew, who lived through the First World War, through the Second World War, and who believed that Hitler will actually come even to the US and take over, and he took his life in Brazil. Just before I come back to, to Stefan Zweig, uh, there is a very interesting uh, movie series recently. Uh, it was adapted uh, from Philip K. Dick. I don't know if you watched it, The, the Man in High Castle. So The Man in High Castle is a story by, by the most famous science fiction author, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, who actually went a step further than Stefan Zweig in the sense that he uh, tries to imagine what would happen if the Nazis and the Japanese formed a kind of unity, uh, formed a kind of uh, uh, union. So you have a book or ten series now, and it's really interesting, I suggest you to, to, to watch it, uh, where the Japanese and the Nazis are in power today. 
and how the world looks like, and then you have a resistance and so on and so on. And I think really by, by, by reading or watching this kind of what-if scenarios, uh, we can come to some interesting uh, questions about our current lives as well, and the crisis of Europe. So, back to Stefan Zweig, in his autobiography, The World of Yesterday, uh, he describes in detail not only how it was possible for Hitler to come to power, uh, but actually he starts by describing the days before the First World War. And he says, just before the First World War happened, I noticed something very interesting. So it was summer 1914, and he says the summer was sommerlicher than ever. I don't even know if there's a reason why Ger German language is the language of philosophy and of great poetry. I don't know how to say it in English, which doesn't mean that we don't have great poetry in, in, in English, but okay, philosophy, that's already a question. Uh, but the, 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 the summer was sommerlicher than yet means actually what, what Stefan Zweig wanted to say is that no one could predict that only one month later the, the First World War would break out. And he gives us a very nice quote. Uh, he, he was having holiday in Baden, uh, which is a very small romantic city in Vienna, uh, that was once uh, Beethoven's favorite Sommer Auf, Aufenthalt, so it, it's a very famous place in, in Austria. And here is the quote. In light summer dresses, gay and carefree, the crowds moved about the music in the park. The day was mild, a cloudless sky lay over the broad chestnut trees. It was a day made to be happy. The vacation days would soon set in for the adults and children, and on this holiday they anticipated the entire summer, with its fresh air, its lush green, and the forgetting of all daily cares. And then, in the next days, boom, the First World War happens. Uh, Stefan Zweig described this kind, uh, kind of carefree life in one of his best short uh, stories, fictional stories, uh, which is called, uh, uh, in, in English it's translated, A Carefree Life, but again in German uh, it makes much more sense. In German the title is By the Zoaklosen. By the Zoaklosen, so by the carefree people, the people who don't care, they don't even have, uh, uh, they don't have Zoaklosen. And uh, uh, he it was published in, this, in 1918, also a remarkable year. And it is a story about a visit to the Zoaklosen in the St. Moritz uh, ski resorts, uh, where people were having holidays and so on uh, at the time of the First World War. And he describes uh, uh, the scene as following. And when I read it, just imagine Europe today. Europe falls into rubble. The gypsy band fiddles away. 10,000 people die every day. Dinner is over and the masked ball begins. Widows sit shivering in all the chambers of the world. A bare-shouldered Marquise steps forward, a masked Chinese opposite. This is the masked ball in St. Moritz. Masks and more masks pour in. And truly, they are real. Not a human face amongst them. The mimor sauces are, are lit. The dance commence, commences, sweet, soft rhythms, while elsewhere ship, ships sink into the deep and trenches are stormed. So again, we have this, uh, this carefree life, parallel universes, where those people who actually don't care about the First World War, uh, they don't even have masks anymore because the masks became real. And then, just before the Second World War happens, Zweig, Stefan Zweig was living in Salzburg and he said he was living in Salzburg and he was already anticipating, learning of course from the experience of, of the First World War, he was anticipating that something is going to happen. Of course, the Second World, World War. And this is the, this is the quote. Uh, of, uh, it's also from Welt von Gestern. My house in Salzburg lay so close to the border that with the naked eye I could view the Berthes Garden mountain on which Adolf Hitler's house stood. An 
uninviting and very disturbing neighborhood. This proximity to the German border, however, gave me an opportunity to judge the threat to the Austrian situation better than my friends in Vienna. In that city, the cafe observers and even many in the government regarded National Socialism as something that was happening over there and that could in no way affect Austria. I think today we live precisely in such a situation. Right-wing extreme governments are somewhere there, in Hungary, in Croatia now, unfortunately as well, in Poland, but already next year you have elections in, in Germany where the AfD could rise into power or at least get more votes than ever before. Next year we will have elections in, in France where National Front National could also raise to power or get more votes than ever. At the same time we are living this kind of carefree life, but one million refugees of course and entered the European Union uh, only in six months. So I think today, as Stefan Zweig said, Europe is really falling into a rubble. So let me start first by, 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 by the refugee crisis and then move to, to terrorism as well and then maybe in the end uh, also come to Greece and actually also maybe to give a kind of more optimistic perspective and what could have been done, what, what could we do. So I think Jagoda mentioned it very well in her introduction, this is a proof that I understand German, uh, where she said that uh, uh, the, the refugee crisis uh, was and still is presented as a kind of uh, uh, natural crisis. So once it started, and of course it didn't start half a year ago because Lampedusa and Greece already had this problem for the last decade and not only for six months, so it didn't start, but of course uh, uh, we in the West and Germany, also Croatia, Austria started to care about the refugee crisis only in the moment when it penetrated from the periphery to the center of the European Union. When it was happening at the periphery, we actually didn't care. And what you can see is something which uh, a French semiotician called Roland Barthes described very well in the 50s in his mythologies. Uh, is when he said that you can find, you can be sure that, you, that we talk about ideology in the moment that you have a process of transforming history into a natural, trans, into a nat natural process. So something which is a deep historical uh, uh, process is being presented as something which is natural. And the same happened with the refugee crisis. So when you hear that we talk about refugee flaws, that we talk about uh, the influx of refugees, the waves of refugees who were entering through the Balkan route and so on, you can be sure that we talk about that we have to do with ideology. That this is actually ideology because it is not a natural catastrophe, it is a deep historical process. This is the reason why, uh, for instance, uh, Peter Colbert, a uh, great out who wrote a great book about Haiti, uh, when the earthquake in Haiti happened, uh, he said, this is not a natural catastrophe. Because the earthquake in Haiti was, of course, a natural process, but the consequences, which were so deep and which are so disastrous that they still exist today and the people in Haiti have to cope with them, were an effect of 200, 300 years of colonialism and also austerity measures and structural reforms and so on. So if Haiti was better economically developed, the earthquake wouldn't hit them so much. This is what it means that the earthquake wasn't a natural catastrophe. And I would say the same for the so-called refugee crisis. European Union doesn't have a refugee crisis. Lebanon has a refugee crisis. Lebanon is a country with 4.5 million inhabitants who have more than 2 million Syrians in a country. So imagine a country such as Denmark or a country such as Croatia, uh, which is also 4.5 million population, having 2 million refugees. Europe, with 500 million inhabitants, uh, has now 1 million refugees. And don't get me wrong, I don't think I think this is 
first of all, a humanitarian crisis. I, when I say it is not a refugee crisis, I don't mean that there is no crisis, but it has a deep historical, I would say, and geopolitical uh, uh, origin. And it is first and foremost a humanitarian crisis, but at the same time, it is a crisis of European foreign policy. And you, can, you could see it uh, pretty well recently with, with the case of Jan Böhneman, for instance, uh, when he was making fun out of, of Erdogan. And, you know, this is something which I would describe as export-import policy of, of the European Union, which is actually the only foreign policy which exists today. First we export wars to Libya, Syria, then we import the refugees, then we export the refugees again to, to Erdogan, and then in return we import again the so-called so democratic uh, values of the Ottoman Empire. Where now in the West, in Germany, in the heart of Europe, people are being persecuted because of making fun out of a dictator in Turkey. At the same time, the European Union is investing 6 billion euros into Turkey, where journalists are in prison, where Turkey will use the money, among other things, to get rid of the, Tur of, of the Kurds, and where the refugee crisis won't be solved. And it cannot be solved because the, the refugee crisis uh, is a geopolitical crisis which is even bigger than the, than the involvement of the European Union. It is much deeper and it goes much more far, far, far away. So if we just stay at Turkey, uh, Turkey is sponsoring through Qatar. Qatar is sponsoring the Muslim Brotherhood, which is in Turkey. And through the Muslim Brotherhood, Turkey is trying to create the most effective opposition in, in Syria. At the same time, Turkey is sponsoring ISIS. At the same time, you have groups. This was a very bizarre article published recently, two weeks ago, when it was found out that uh, rebel groups in Syria uh, were fighting each other. So one group was sponsored by the Pentagon and the other one was sponsored by the CIA. And they were fighting each other in Syria. So you can see that you have even this kind of contradiction, which is a contradiction, I think, geopolitical contradiction, but unfortunately it's not. At the same time, if you take, for instance, it also shows a lot uh, about the complete uh, uh, failure of foreign policy of the European Union, uh, a very curious case of someone called uh, Berlin Gildo. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, it's a Swedish citizen who was uh, brought in front of the court, uh, I think it was in 2015, uh, because he was accused of being part of a rebel, uh, a rebel group in Syria, of being a terrorist. But the case is now inexistent. Uh, why? Because his lawyers said that the, if they find out and found proofs that the British intelligence was actually sponsoring the very group of which he was accused of to being part of. So you can see that the West is even fighting against the West itself. CIA against Pentagon, British intelligence service, and so on and so on. Then of course if you go further, you will see that the refugee crisis cannot be solved by investing six billion euros to Erdogan, or the building fences again, or by suspending the Schengen, or by going against the Dublin Convention and so on. Because then you will come, of course, not only to the French interest. In 2014, Francois Hollande even also admitted that they were investing into arms in Syria, so you have a French involvement, of course, which already originated in Libya, uh, years before Syria which is also connected. Then, of course, you have the U.S. interest. Then, of course, you have the Russian interest, which is not only a, to have access to a warm port, uh, but it is also something which will bring us into gas line, uh, uh, pipeline politics, where on the one hand you have uh, this, the plan to, to, to build a Sunni pipeline, so-called Sunni pipeline. On the other hand, you have a plan to build a Shia pipeline. Uh, and at the same time, uh, which means, on the one hand, you have uh, Iran, Afghanistan and Russia, on the other hand, of course, you have Saudi Arabia, Qatar and so on, and all these pipelines should go through Syria and then, of course, to the European Union. When then, of course, you have a problem that Russia last year already signed a deal with China, which is the biggest energetic deal in recent history. Uh, so then you come also to China. Uh, then 
you have something which is called TTIP, uh, the Transatlantic uh, Free Trade Agreement, which is not free, of course, there is nothing free in that. Uh, and maybe now with the recent leaks, not only the WikiLeaks, but also by Greenpeace, maybe now there is an opportunity actually to, 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 to really oppose the TTIP. Uh, but the TTIP is basically an attempt of the US uh, to integrate the European economy even more than it was. Because if on one hand you have something which is, which can be best described as Euro-Asian integration, which means that Russia and China are now actually starting to work together, uh, then it is a problem of course for the US, because Europe could go into that direction. And it's already happening. And then we again come to the, to the, to the failure of and is connected to the failure of internal politics and foreign politics of the European Union. Why do the Chinese own more than half, more than 50% of the period port in Greece, which is one of the most important ports in, in, in Europe? It's not because Tsipras uh, uh, wanted to sell it. Of course, we can criticize Tsipras and go into the reasons why did he do it, uh, although it goes against the Thessaloniki program. But it is, first and foremost, I think, a consequence of failed internal politics of, of the European Union. In the sense that the so-called Troika, or however we call it, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the Eurogroup, uh, ECOFIN, uh, European Central Bank, that they, for years, imposed austerity measures which are obviously not working at all, to Greece, that because of the, of the implementation of this, what we were referring to as structural adjustments, or it could be also called shock therapy, that because of this, governments all around Europe, and mainly governments of the periphery, periphery of the European Union, Spain, Greece, Portugal, and so on, are forced to do something which we did after the collapse of Yugoslavia, which is so-called transition period, which actually means huge, massive privatizations. Uh, this is something what happened in Yugoslavia, where I come from, we had something which was called, we didn't only have state ownership, but we also had social ownership, which is even more radical. Uh, but after the war, which served as a kind of shock therapy, again, uh, uh, we had this huge wave of, of privatizations, where today something which was the national telecommunica telecommunications company is now Deutsche Telekom, uh, something, uh, uh, there is no automobile industry, there are no shipyards anymore, everything is getting privatized. Now we find ourselves at the, at, at the moment where even education and healthcare system is getting privatized. And the same process which was successfully implemented in the Balkans during the 90s, and we still have these consequences today, with huge unemployment, for instance, the unemployment rate of young people in Croatia is 54%. The unemployment rate among young people in Greece is 60%. So just imagine this, that every second young person doesn't have a job, and they don't even have an opportunity to have a job. Because it was the Italian Prime Minister Mario Monti, Monti who recently said, recently, several years ago, he described perfectly well this new kind of ideology of the European Union, but not only European Union, which is called flex security, which would mean you have flexibility to find new job, mini jobs, which are so, so, so popular in, in Western Europe, and at the same time you have security. But of course what you don't have in flex security is precisely the second part, which is security. We are only flexible. And Mario Monti said the young people, he was on national television in Italy, he said the young people had to get used to the idea that they won't have a stable job anymore. And this is happening all around Europe. So the internal politics, uh, economic politics, if you want, social politics of the European Union is failing as a result, of course I'm simplifying, simplifying things now for the sake of the argument and uh, because it would be good also to open the discussion, uh, because of that is one of the consequences uh, the Greek government was forced to sell uh, a significant part of Port Piraeus. As a consequence, China is now already inside of the European Union. At the same time, 
China last year as well, and I think this could completely change the geo geopolitics of, of the 21st century. This is what I will say now. China is building something which they call the New Silk Road, uh, because the Chinese are very smart, as you know. And, and they are smart because what they are doing actually is a combination of the best uh, from capitalism and the best of communism. But also, at the same time, it can be the worst. In the sense that, what, what is the biggest problem of our governments when they come in power? The problem is that every four years they exchange. Of course, this is not necessarily a problem because they have an opportunity to vote uh, for other governments. But imagine, for instance, cities in power in Greece. They come to power and you find yourselves on a table with all the agreements which uh, previous governments already signed. And then if you don't deliver huge amounts of, of millions of euros to private European banks, then, of course, you have something which, which happened last year in Greece with the capital controls and then the referendum and then the third memorandum. But what China is doing is it's, 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 it's precisely the opposite. They still do something which existed already in the, which existed in the Soviet Empire in, in, in Yugoslavia, which was called Petoletka. But in China, they don't have Petoletka, but they have a 20 years economic plan. And as part of the, of, the, of the 20 years economic plan is the new Silk Road, uh, which is a new railway system, uh, which will be longer than the Trans-Siberian Railway, which will bring cheap Chinese goods from, from Beijing to Hamburg, I don't know, in two or three days. <coughs> Why are the Chinese doing this? Because they perceive that 90% of the <coughs> transport of goods in the world, 90%, uh, go both through water, through the oceans, and so on. And of course, as you know, it takes a lot of days, several weeks, even or months, for goods to arrive from, I don't know, uh, South America to Europe, from China to Europe, from China to Africa, and so on. But if you, if you have a new Silk Road, a new railway, which will go through Europe, uh, actually, we will soon live uh, in a Chinese Europe, if, you, if, if, if it goes on. And if you think this is conspiracy theory, uh, unfortunately it's not. So, uh, two years ago in Belgrade, I mean, what you have to do is just to follow the signs uh, of the future in the present. And then try to deconstruct the signs and you will come to a very interesting an uh, answers and developments. So, two years ago, the, prime, the Chinese Prime Minister visited Serbia and he met with Vucic, who is again re-elected as the new Prime Minister of Serbia, and he met with Viktor Orban. What did they do? No one in the Balkans, no one in Europe even took notice. No one was writing about that in the Western press, as far as I could have seen. But what they did is actually what they do is that they find governments in Europe, so Serbia is not a member, member state of the European Union, Hungary is, uh, and they are building the Silk Road you know, not like this, you know, you don't build it like this and then you go from country to country. But actually when the political situation somewhere, somewhere is positive for Chinese investments, then you pick up this country, this country, this country, and you actually construct it. So what they started is that they, don't, they still don't have the new Silk Road like going from Beijing to, to I don't know, uh, Düsseldorf or something. But there are small parts of the Silk Road being created, as we speak, in, in the European Union. So when these three prime ministers met in Belgrade, they made a deal uh, to reconstruct the railway between Belgrade and Budapest, which usually takes around nine or ten hours, and now it will be three hours. And just to show you how they will speed up the whole process of transport of goods. So what you have here is a radical shift in geopolitics. At the same time, European Union doesn't have a clear answer. The European Union cannot even have a constructive internal policy which will get rid of the high unemployment, but they are actually implementing the same measures which they were implementing the last 25 years and they didn't bring to growth. At the same time, the European Union is still involved in, 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 in foreign interventions. One of them, for instance, you know that uh, the French government had a very significant role in the intervention in Libya. But recently, WikiLeaks uh, 
And we don't speak about the war in Libya anymore, it's something which is there, the same with Afghanistan, the same with Iraq, who cares anymore for all these wars? Uh, although people still live in war zones in those countries as well. Uh, so in Libya the war is not over, you have a civil war in the country, but this presents a big problem for, for the European Union, but not only for the European Union, but also for the partners of the European Union, which is mainly the US. Uh, so recently WikiLeaks published a very interesting document uh, about the so-called Operation Sofia, which you can find on WikiLeaks. Uh, I don't know why it's called Operation Sofia, but it's very interesting. Uh, so you know that already on the European level you have something which is called Frontex, uh, who are actually trying to protect the fortress Europe. But now Frontex uh, is going a step further uh, in the precisely as part of Operation Sofia, uh, which is an operation created by European authorities in order to prevent the smugglers smuggling refugees into the European Union, uh, mainly through the so-called Mediterranean route. Uh, but now, look at this situation. You had the so-called Balkan route from Syria through Turkey, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, for some reason, they, 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 they made a circle around Bosnia, mainly. Uh, Serbia, Croatia, Hungary, Austria, Germany. Then, of course, the, the future of Europe, and the future of Europe is called Hungary. Viktor Orban shut down all the borders. Then you had a domino effect that also others started to shut down border, borders. Then you had the West Balkan Conference in Vienna last year, at the end of last year where all foreign ministers, except the foreign minister of Greece, were present uh, to shut down completely the Balkan route, which is now shut down. As a consequence, now you have uh, soldiers shooting refugees in Slovakia and also on the Turkish border. At the same time, if you have a closure of the Balkan route, you have a natural development. Of course, it's not natural, uh, but it's connected uh, uh, precisely to this historical process, that most of the refugees are now moving to this part of the Mediterranean, and Libya as well. Together with them, ISIS is now also opening uh, centers in Libya. And as a kind of answer of the European Union to this, they create something which is called Operation Sofia, but which goes even much further than just trying to prevent new refugee flows through the Mediterranean. Uh, so it consists of three parts. The first part is the military operation in high seas, which means that uh, in the high seas of the Mediterranean, you have not only Frontex, but the army uh, governed by, by an Italian commander who was writing this letter, which was published by WikiLeaks two months or three months ago. You can, you can check it out. I don't know what is the new development, actually. It would be interesting to find out if they started the, fir the third step. The second step is that they already operate, uh, they, they already operate in the territorial waters of Libya. So the Italian commander asked for a permission to operate in the territorial waters of Libya because they said if we come into the territorial waters then we will be able to be more efficient to prevent new refugee flows from Libya. And this is still not the end. Here we come to the third part of Operation Sofia which is explicitly stated by the Italian commander asking his authorities to give him permission to